So hi everyone again, my name is Tori Martell. I am the social media community manager here at the Allergy and Asthma Network. And I'm so excited to welcome everyone to our third Living Well with Asthma live virtual event. We started the Living Well with Asthma campaign to raise awareness that small changes in your daily life can improve lung health. We address a different topic in our live virtual events. Today, we are focusing on diet, nutrition, and how it affects your lung health. Before we get started, we will once again hold a drawing for a new Fitbit Lux Smart Tracker. If you are joining us through Zoom, you are already registered for the drawing. If you are joining us through Facebook and would like to be included in the drawing, we will drop a link on our Facebook post. So make sure to click on that and register and that will include you within the drawing. We'll announce the winner at the end of today's event and contact the winner by email. You must be here at the end to be eligible. Look for links to our website in the Zoom chat and on Facebook to get more information on our topic today. We also would like to thank GSK for sponsoring this event in our Healthy Lifestyles campaign. And with that, let's get started. We are thrilled to once again be joined by our two guest hosts, Dr. Payal Gupta and Courtney Kwong Hing. You're welcome to join in on the conversation and ask questions using the chat function in Zoom or by posting a comment on our Facebook post. Dr. Gupta is a board certified adult and pediatric allergist and immunologist in New York, as well as chair of the Integrated Medicine Committee for the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Courtney joins us from Berlin, Germany, where she lives with asthma, multiple food allergies, and eczema. Dr. Gupta and Courtney are also co-hosts of their own podcast, Beach Podcast. We'll drop a link to their podcast in the chat so you can learn more about how to subscribe to it. So first, let's find out who's joining us virtually here today. We'll take two quick polls. The first poll will pop up in just a moment. So please uh, pick what's applicable to you. So who's joining us this evening? I'm a person living with asthma. I'm a parent caregiver for someone with asthma. I'm a health professional. I'm someone with another lung condition. I am someone with an interest in how diet may affect asthma or other. We'll take a moment to answer and then we'll see the results. Okay, so here are the results of the poll. So 43% are is someone living with asthma, 15% is a parent or caregiver for someone with asthma, 67% are health professionals, 3% is someone with another lung condition, 30% is someone who has an interest in how diet may affect asthma, and 2% are other. So thank you for answering that, and we'll move on to the next poll. So this one is, do you have asthma or other lung condition? So your choices are, I have asthma, I have allergies, I have COPD, I have other lung disease, or I do not have any lung disease. So once again, we'll wait a moment and then see the results. So the results are shown, 42% have asthma, 25% have allergies, 1% has other lung disease, and 32% do not have any lung disease. So with that, let's turn it over to Courtney and Dr. Gupta. All right, hi everyone. We are happy to be back with you again in a new year. Tonight we're tackling nutrition. <clears throat> and nutrition is a pretty loaded topic, so what works for one person might not work for another person, which means we're actually going to be taking a little bit of a broader look at nutrition, and we're going to be focusing a little bit on obesity and asthma. And then we also plan on tackling some myths or types of food that might be thought of as good for helping asthma management. So before we jump in, we've got one more poll question for you guys. And We'll bring it up now because we want to know a little bit about how you know, what you know about nutrition and asthma. So I'll just wait for the poll question.
All right, here we go. And poll number three is, how much do you know about how nutrition can affect lung health? And your options are, I'm very familiar with nutrition and lung health. I'm somewhat familiar with nutrition and lung health, or I'm not very familiar with nutrition and lung health. And we'll give you a few seconds to think about that. All right, it looks like we are leaning towards the somewhat and not very familiar <laughs> with 47% and 42%. So um, I don't blame you. Nutrition is totally complicated and how it impacts our other health conditions is even more complicated. So we're gonna try and tackle some of that tonight and hopefully you feel like you've got more clarity when you leave us. Um, so with that, let's jump right in. And Dr. G, can you give us some background on the connection between asthma and obesity? Yes. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. So um, we wanted to talk about obesity because, you know, that it ties very uh, closely to nutrition and what we're doing with our bodies and the diet that we're consuming. And so, you know, obesity is a disorder involving excessive body fat that increases the risk of health problems in people. And as with other illnesses, asthma is also affected by obesity. So when someone is obese, uh, it is thought um, to play a role, not only in the severity of their asthma, but um, some research, uh, researchers also believe that it can actually cause asthma because obesity has been linked to increased inflammation in the body and asthma is an inflammatory disease. Um, there seems to be a link between obesity actually causing asthma. And then obese children and obese adults have more severe asthma, poorer quality of life, and worse asthma control um, because of their obesity. And again, um, you know, um, this is all linked to multiple factors, but we know that asthmatics of all ages do worse um, if they are obese and actually even if they're also overweight or if they're overweight or obese. So um, there's definitely a link between um, those things and asthma. And can you just define, so you defined obesity for us, but can you give us um, some more clarity between what obese is and what overweight is just so that we kind of know where people are factoring themselves in to the conversation? Yeah, so the way that we um, evaluate if someone is obese or overweight, we actually use the body mass index to help us figure out when someone is overweight versus obese versus being underweight versus being of a normal weight. So um, body mass index is a calculation done based on um, someone's height and weight. And the body mass index, again, looks at um, how much fattiness someone has in their body. Um, um, so fat is obviously not a great thing to have. We need a little bit of fat on our body. So not having any fat is not good, but there's an op, there's like an ideal. And again, I keep saying, I keep using these quotations because um, these are all based on, you know, research that's been done. But again, you um, with the data that we have, sometimes uh, there's researchers that feel that we need even more data so that we can maybe even have different parameters for different uh, races, for different um, people. And so we need to keep, uh, you know, we need to take these as like a guideline, but they're not a hard and fast rule for everybody. So, you know, I in general, if your body mass index, something that you can actually Google, if you Google body mass index calculator, um, there's lots of calculators out there that will quickly calculate your body mass index based on your weight and height. And if it's less than 18.5, that means that you're underweight. If it's 18.5 to 25, that's the healthy weight that we want you to be at. 25 to 30 is considered overweight. And then once you hit 30 or higher, that's when you're considered obese. So really, um, you know, when we, we want to look at these numbers and we kind of monitor it because when you're hitting that overweight 
kind of marker, then that's a time that we might want to have more discussions about, you know, what does your uh, diet and exercise routine look like? Are there some changes that could be made? How are you feeling? How is your body feeling? Um, and what kind of led to maybe even going from being um, a quote unquote normal weight to being overweight. Um, so, and I think that we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but ultimately um, it's about how you're feeling and um, the best weight for you. And so um, even though we can use these parameters, if you feel good at a certain weight, but maybe you're falling at a weird BMI that, um, you know, that can be discussed, but um you know, one example is let's say you gain 10 pounds during the holidays and, um, and now all of a sudden you're having a harder time breathing, um, and you're reaching for your inhaler more, you feel like it's harder to go up those stairs or you're having acid reflux related to the extra weight that you've gained. Well, then obviously those extra 10 pounds might not be good for your body. And we might need to reevaluate how you can, um, get back to that, you know, get back to, um, losing those 10 pounds. So, um, again, it's all about figuring out what's healthy for you. That's really good to hear that it, you know, I think your body tells you a lot and it's good to hear that you're saying that it's also about how you're experiencing breathing in your current body and how you measure that from other times in your life. So can we just go back a little bit to the more research that's been done around diet? Um, and how it's linked to obesity and asthma, because we really want to know about the nitty gritty food stuff. So can we dive into that a little bit more? Yeah, so, you know, um, the U.S. is considered the West, like Western, um, and so there's something called the Western diet pattern. And what we find in the Western diet pattern is that it tends to be high in saturated fatty acids, low in fiber, and low in antioxidants and high in sugars like fructose. So, um, you know, there's a growing body of literature that all of those things put together are, are harmful to our bodies and can um, cause um, an increase in, uh, you know, an ability to become overweight, obese. And, um, and then there's also some data in asthma, asthmatics that it shows that a single, in meal and high in saturated uh, fats has shown to increase um, airway inflammation and decrease the way that um, an asthmatic might respond to their albuterol or their bronchodilator medication. So thinking about this and planning your daily meals may be important and something that we can all use um, as a target for a good diet. Um, and so one other diet that we kind of wanted to mention as, um, you know, that you might be reading about or seeing a lot and different magazine articles, Google searches is the Mediterranean diet. And so that is like in Greece um, and places like that in the Mediterranean where um, uh, they eat more fish rather than chicken and red meat. Um, they eat more plant-based foods such as whole grains, vegetables, um, fruits, nuts, seeds, herbs, spices, and um, and that's opposed to the Western diet, which is more of the processed foods, um, red meats, high sugar foods, and prepackaged foods. So I think our lifestyle here of the go, 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 and wanting to have easy meals kind of factors into that. Um, and so we can put um, a link in the show notes to kind of give you some fun ideas and fun recipes for things that you can try at home that are more leaning towards that Mediterranean style of cooking and eating. Um, and then you can see if you see a difference, you know, after, um, following some of those uh, recipes to see if that makes you feel better. Um, and, you know, uh, it just helps you gain more energy. And since we're talking about the Mediterranean diet and kind of like how the Western diet and the lifestyle of fast pace and ready-made food, what you mentioned is that I think another component to the Mediterranean diet that's not talked about a lot is how there's also an enjoyment of eating and there's a culture around food and you take time to eat. So, you know, you sit with your food and then you eat it slowly. And sometimes when you eat it slowly, you don't eat as much because if you're eating in front of the TV or if you're distracted, then you don't realize you're actually full and you just keep eating what's out on your plate. 
So I just wanted to mention that as an aside is that like you had mentioned before earlier that there is like an emotional side to food and that we should also enjoy it. We shouldn't just demonize it. And I think that when we talk about diet, we have a tendency to move towards the like bad side of it, but food is really good and, and we should enjoy it. So back to food, <laughs> is there any other research that's interested in, um, sorry, any more research that we can see about obesity and asthma and the connection? Yeah, so um, there's also, I'm sure everyone's been reading a lot about vitamin D also lately, and there has been some links to vitamin D and uh, vitamin D deficiency um, and asthma and obesity, actually. So um, vitamin D is found in foods like oily fish. Um, it's also, there's a lot of vitamin D fortified foods like milk is often fortified in vitamin D. And then we also get vitamin D from exposure to sun. So, um, vitamin D deficiency might put someone at higher risk for respiratory infections. And that's why I think it's been in the media a lot lately, um, which can in turn cause asthma exacerbations. Um, in addition, vitamin D deficiency may predispose someone to develop obesity, but um, obviously, you know, having the right amount of vitamin D doesn't mean that um, that everything's good, right? There's lots of different factors in all of this, but there has been association between lower levels of vitamin D and that potentially increasing your risk for, um, you know, these respiratory infections and also. Um, obesity. And so, and that's especially if you live in areas that tend to be cold and don't, and you don't see the sun as often, it's important to maybe get your levels checked and make sure everything looks good. Um, and then you might have also read that, um, omega-6 fatty acids are worse for you than omega-3 fatty acids. Um, there is some research in asthma that shows that, that maybe, um, you know, the omega-6 is better than the omega-3. However, both forms of fatty acids are important. And so it's really important um, to kind of have that balance. And can you just uh, explain a little bit more about omega-3 and omega-6 and what foods contain either of them? Yeah, so omega-3, um, fatty acids are found, um, there's actually three different types and, um, the, there's, you know, the names are not important. And again, we can put that in the show notes too, but, um, they're found in foods like, like I mentioned, fatty fish, um, like salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, um, eggs, um, flax seeds and flaxseed oil, walnuts, soybeans, tofu, um, fortified foods, like some margarines, juices, and yogurts. So, um, you know, as you can see, there's a lot of, you know, healthy options in that list. And so omega threes are the good ones and supposedly, but then omega six is also found in a lot of good foods like soybean, um, corn, um, safflower, 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 sorry, nuts and seeds, again, meat, poultry, fish, and eggs. So as you can see, you don't want to avoid anything completely. Um, you want to make sure that you have a good balanced diet that contains a little bit of all of these foods. Um, but when you're looking at labels and things like that, if you find that uh, a lot of things that you're consuming, especially processed foods and things like that contain higher levels of one or the other, um, and th th something that you might want to be aware of. But again, um, as you can see from the list, a lot of those foods are good foods for us to have in our diet. Yeah, it's uh, here in Germany, we have this meal, it's very strange to me, but, and I'm allergic to flax, so I've never tried it, but they <clears throat> basically take like a Greek yogurt and put flax oil on it. And I was like, that's perfect for your omega-3. Um, and since we're talking about food, we wanna know a little bit about your eating habits. So we're gonna pull up our final poll question and we're gonna see a little bit about where you guys are. And then we're gonna tackle some myths. And I see that in the <clears throat> chat, we have something that someone's asking this question, so we're getting there. Um, so here we go. The poll is, what types of foods do you eat regularly to stay healthy? We've got options like leafy green veggies, such as salad, broccoli, spinach, or kale, fish, like salmon, mackerel, or tuna, fruits, uh, 
we're seeing two to four servings, including berries of all kinds, vitamin D rich foods such as milk and eggs, or and or uh, whole grains, wheat, rye, oatmeal, and quinoa. So we'll let you guys read through that list again and tick off which ones you eat. I think we're gonna get the results soon. Ah, there we go. All right. Well, it looks like you guys are all getting in your leafy greens. That's excellent, 83%. And then fish, 55%. Uh, That's all right. I mean, maybe if you all wanna check out the Mediterranean diet, that will go up. We've got fruits at 73%, vitamin D rich foods at 65 and whole grains at 59. So, you know, all of these foods are really good foods to have in your diet. And if you are adding them in to all of your meals, then it looks like you are on the right path to a balanced diet. And on that, it leads us nicely into our, what we're calling our myth busting section of tonight. And we're gonna cover some food groups that are considered either good or bad for people living with asthma. And let's start off with this question, which I see has been in the chat is, what about inflammation? So we know that asthma is connected to inflammation. So what about eating anti-inflammatory foods like leafy greens? Is that gonna help us with our asthma? Yeah, so anti-inflammatory foods um, is something that's actively being studied now. So um, what that means is we're trying to see um, if there's components of the foods and beverages that we're eating that might have an anti-inflammatory effect on our body. And actually the, the studies do show that, um, that there might be something to that and that there might be certain foods that cause um, more inflammation versus other foods that might actually help with inflammation. And so um, according to Harvard Health, um, eating at least one and a half to two cups of diverse fruits every day can help keep us healthy. And um, one strategy for that um, is to eat with the season. So kind of picking like choosing grapes and stone fruits during the summer when they're in season, apples and pears in the falls, pomegranates in the winter, and then citrus fruits in the citrus fruits and cherries in the spring. It all sounds really yummy and nice. And so it's a way to kind of keep things changing and different, but fruits um, do tend to have a lot of anti-inflammatory benefits. And, um, and one fruit actually in particular, the berries, are like super anti-inflammatory fruits. And so strawberries, blackberries, cranberries, blueberries, these are actually all of my 18 month old's favorite <laughs> foods. So he's on his way, um, but these are like gem gems, you know, um, they're anti-inflammatory. Um, they also have a lot of fiber, vitamin C, um, and, uh, and all of those things also, uh, you know, are very beneficial. So, um, again, you know, berry consumption has been linked to lower heart disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and just in general, we feel that, you know, because of its anti-inflammatory benefits that, you know, if you have asthma, we don't, we don't have studies on it, but that it should help. Okay. I'm very glad that raspberries are my favorite fruit. <laughs> So I'm, you know, I'm also helping there with my love of raspberries. Um, so we talked about those foods, which are good for us. What about um, inflammatory foods? Are there any inflammatory foods that we should most likely be avoiding? Yeah, so I mean, foods that are linked with inflammation include things like alcohol, sugar, and high fat 
processed meats like hot dogs. So as you can tell from that list, none of those things are things that we would be, you know, telling people if they're asking us what our healthy foods are, those would not be on the list. And, um, and it's true, research shows that they do uh, tend to um, be linked with more inflammation in the body. And so, you know, again, everything in moderation, I'm not saying that people can't have a hot dog here and there um, at a, you know, baseball game or whatever, um, or, um, you know, even like some high fat, uh, or even some sugar or alcohol, um, that wouldn't be realistic. And that's, you know, the really important part of everything that we're talking about, like moderation is really important, but if your diet tends to be, if you're eating hot dogs every day, you might want to rethink that if you're, um, you know, if you have a sweet tooth, then, you know, instead of picking that, like, white sugar based dessert, maybe you could pick something that's really uses, um, you know, pears or raspberries or, um, you know, another fruit um, as its main source of um, sweet, right? So grabbing um, fruit. And, you know, one thing that I love doing is just baking a pear. I don't know if anyone's ever tried that, but it is so good. You don't have to add anything to it. You can maybe sprinkle a little bit of cinnamon on top of it, but even just baking a pear is like, it, it's mind blowing. It's just the most amazing dessert ever. And so you really don't have to use sugar. Um, you can still have a sweet tooth um, and get those little cravings in, but, um, but you know, these things are the things that have been linked to, um, to inflammation. That's a great tip about also thinking um, about fruit in a different context. So like, how can you eat a pear in a different way? Like, or how could you eat, for instance, one of the recipes we dropped is a strawberry kale salad. So it's like, how do you eat strawberries in a more savory manner? So it's like flipping them around and like, how can you prepare it differently? And then it's more exciting to get all these foods that you're supposed to be getting in. And then they're not feeling like a burden as much. So. The next kind of food I've heard about a food group, I'm not sure, I think you're going to explain this a little bit more to us, but is sulfites. So I heard that sulfites can trigger an asthma attack if you eat high amounts of them. And I also know that here in Europe, sulfites fall under the top 14 allergens. So can you clarify a little bit about the impact of sulfites on asthma? Yeah, so sulfites can cause a reaction in some asthmatics, but not everyone is sensitive to them. And so um, the history behind sulfite use is that um, sulfites is, uh, was used in a preservative in foods and beverages, um, and it increased, the use increased dramatically in the 70s and 80s. And then due to severe reactions to sulfites, um, the FDA actually put a ban on its use in August of 1986 in certain um, areas. So they banned um, the use of sulfites for fresh fruit and vegetables, thank goodness. And so sulfites, however, continue to be used um, in potatoes, shrimp, beer, wine, and also used um, sometimes in the pharmaceutical industry. And so when somebody um, is sensitive to sulfites, it's, um, you know, they can have symptoms ranging from mild wheezing to um, potentially life-threatening asthma, uh, like an asthma exacerbation. Um, and uh, and also very rarely, it can also cause uh, generalized anaphylaxis, um, which can be very scary. So when you're sensitive to sulfites, you're actually inhaling the sulfur dioxide that comes from sulfite containing foods that you eat or drink. Um, so it's actually the inhalation of, um, of the sulfur dioxide and not actually consuming it that's causing the reaction. So again, it's still fairly rare, but it can happen. If you think you might be experiencing um, symptoms that align with a possible um, sulfite allergy, the treatment is avoidance of foods and drinks and medications that contain sulfites. Um, things like wine, again, fermented foods, uh, canned foods, these things are um, generally not super healthy 
healthy for you anyways. So um, if you have to avoid them, it might be a blessing in disguise. Um, and then we'll put um, the names that sulfites can be found in, in different ingredients, again, in the show notes. So things like sulfur dioxide, potassium bisulfate, potassium meta bisulfate, um, so there's a bunch of, you know, terms that you should look for in ingredients, but again, you know, this is not everybody. If you have this, I think you would, um, you know, you would start seeing a pattern and, um, you should definitely talk to your doctor. Okay, great. Cause I know that I have seen like a sulfite, a low sulfite diet, which brings me to one more other type of diet I've read about, and that's a low histamine diet. <clears throat> excuse me, it's a low histamine diet. Uh, so could you talk to us a little bit about histamine and why a low histamine diet would be something that people would consider if they were having asthma problems and whether it is, you know, valid? Yeah. And I just wanted to go back to that low sulfite diet. So again, if you're sensitive, you'd want a no sulfite diet. Um, so if you're not actually sensitive, just decreasing your consumption of a food uh, that you're not actually sensitive to is not going to help your asthma. So um, I just want to make that clarification. That's why all of these like kind of diet, um, we call it the diet culture, like finding, you know, people like to promote themselves for a certain thing that they're like very specialized in. And so if you're following somebody that's practicing a low sulfite diet, I don't really know what that would do for you if you don't have a true sulfite sensitivity. Um, so then getting back to histamine. Um, so histamine, just to define what histamine is, is it's a chemical that's released by our body um, naturally when we're allergic to something. Um, and that is what causes the itching, the sneezing, the congestion and wheezing um, for some people who have allergic um, asthma related to, um, their allergies, their environmental allergies or their food allergies. So there have been, um, so, so then people started to think, you know, is histamine found in foods? Like, could it be that, um, there's external histamine that gets released by food that could be causing people's symptoms. And so, um, you know, the studies on that are actually all over the place. So if you look at one study, they'll say that this food releases a lot of histamine. Then you look at another study and, and even the foods themselves can release different amounts of histamine, depending on how they're prepared and like fermented foods might release more of histamine. So, you know, that's tricky in itself. Then secondly, the data to support a low histamine diet in conditions that might benefit from it where like things like uh, people who have chronic hives, for example, we think that the hives are secondary to histamine. And so um, a lot of my patients with hives will come in and say, you know, is it important that I go on a low histamine diet? Well, we don't have enough data to show that it's actually beneficial. And, um, and same thing in asthma, which might be mediated by histamine release. We just don't have the data. And so again, um, Courtney and I have mentioned this several times, but I think it's just a really important point that we want to drive home is that food is meant to be a moment of comfort and enjoyment throughout our day. So we're meant to eat, you know, three to four to five times a day, you know, with snacks and all that stuff. And it's meant to be something that's exciting and fun and something that we enjoy. And so when we put a lot of restrictions um, that might not be very helpful, um, we create a like an anxiety around food, we create stress around food. And then all of a sudden something that you need to do to keep your body um, running, right? You need fuel. So food is our fuel. Um, all of a sudden that becomes stressful. And, um, and so that's just something that we really want to mention here is that we don't want people to make food stressful. We want you to enjoy your food. We just want to help you understand how certain foods might be um, more helpful to your body than other foods. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I can't agree more. Um, and I think that we're going to get back to that just at the end, a little bit more about like diet culture and attacking a better diet and how do you go about it. But before we get there, I have one more food group I don't know, I classify it as a food group because I have anxiety if I don't have a cup of it in the morning. But um, here's a little anecdote uh, as to why I'm asking this question. 
when I was a kid in grade school, I was at my friend's house for a sleepover and I didn't realize she had like a hundred pets and I didn't pack my inhaler and I had an asthma attack. Luckily her dad was a doctor and I also lived a few blocks away. So they called my mom and said, come back with the inhaler. And while I was waiting, he gave me a cup of coffee and I'm curious as to know why would a doctor give a nine-year-old a cup of coffee at 8.30 at night knowing that she's probably going to be bouncing off the walls <laughs> at his daughter's sleepover. Um, so what was it about that coffee that helped me in that interim period before my mom arrived with the inhaler? Yeah, so that's a really sweet um, story. I'm glad that you did okay and that you got the inhaler and that you didn't end up in the hospital. So that's really good. Um, but you know, the, the point about caffeine is that caffeine is actually related to another medication that we have used to treat asthma. And that medication is called theophylline. Um, and the way that we know that caffeine or caffeine derivatives can help asthma patients is that it is a weak bronchodilator. So it helps relax the smooth muscles and kind of open up those muscles a little bit. And it also reduces the respiratory muscle fatigue, which is interesting because, you know, it helps it is supposed to help wake us up, but it also helps wake up your muscles, which is important when you're having an asthma attack technically. And so in one um, review of literature, the conclusion was that caffeine appears to improve airway function um, to a certain degree for up to four hours potentially in people with asthma. Um, but, and so that, that goes to say also that people should maybe avoid it at least four hours prior to getting your lung function testing in, uh, in a doctor's office is something to keep in mind. Um, but, Bottom line is, is that it might help a little bit, but remember, you know, your cup of coffee could be strong. It could be a, you know, not so strong cup of coffee. It's really hard to like monitor, um, to monitor like the amount of caffeine that you're ingest, ingesting um, with just something like coffee, right? And so, um, and we stopped using theophylline as much because of the negative side effects of it, such as increasing your heart rate too much and, um, and just causing other side effects. And so, um, you know, it can't, shouldn't be used as a treatment um, necessarily, you know, the ER doctor that you, your friend was um, using it just as a kind of like a bridge to you getting an inhaler. So I would never tell anyone to reach for a cup of coffee instead of their inhaler. Um, but could it theoretically help? Yes, theoretically, it could potentially help. But, um, but you know, we, uh, again, you can't use it in, in replacement of your medications, but um, theoretically, it could help. Okay, so coffee in the morning is okay. Berries in the morning is okay. I think we're on a good start here. And as you guys can tell quickly, um, we dropped the link in uh, the chat here because it's, uh, it explains a little bit more about caffeine and coffee. So if you're really curious about that, it's in the, the asthma allergy network or allergy asthma network, excuse me, <clears throat> asthma on the mind. Anyways, they dropped the link in a really super helpful article to read in case you wanna know more about that. Um, but we're gonna quickly wrap up because we're going over, <laughs> which Dr. G and I tend to do. We like to talk a lot and we wanna to get to some of your questions, but I just wanna reiterate it, like to conclude this, that, you know, there are a lot of diets out there that are telling you, I'm an anti-inflammatory diet. I'm a quick fix diet. I'm gonna reset your body and you'll be fine. These diets are, are short term diets. You know, they're not long-term solutions. When you're done the diet, you don't really know what you're going to do afterwards because you were following that regimen and now you have to get back on track on your own. So think about really small changes that you can do because you don't realize the power of these small incremental changes that, that will impact your diet and that will impact the way you're feeling and your overall nutrition. So don't feel like you have to take on the whole world at once. Think about what can you do today that you can continue doing 10 years from now and then work on the little steps. So that's just like my little personal takeaway is that I think nutrition can get really overwhelming, but it's you're taking your first step and then you take the next step and you don't have to like get there tomorrow. So 
I think with that, we are going to get to some of your questions because I know we have a few and Tori is back with us. Yes, so thank you to everyone who put in some questions in our chat. They were all great. We'll try to answer as many as we can. So our first question is, how should those with an allergy to the berry fruits handle their diet related to controlling inflammation and asthma? Yeah, so again, if you're allergic to a particular food, you need to avoid it. Um, and these are all just, you know, um, examples of foods that can be helpful, of fruits that can be helpful. Um, we mentioned a lot of other fruits. So really any fruit has um, anti-inflammatory benefits um, because it's natural um, and, you know, in moderation, they can be helpful. So if you can't eat berries, that's okay. Um, it was just an example, but you can all, you can have so many other foods that are healthy, um, other fruits like pears, apples, um, the apple a day keeps the doctor away, right? So all of those kind of things, there's lots of other fruits that you can um, eat that will help you stay healthy. And again, you know, the inflammation component, that's just a, a small component of it, but we just know that they're healthy foods. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Our next question is, what is the effect of salicylate in food on asthma? Um, so salicylates, you know, I would honestly, I would have to say that I would need to look up, look up a little bit about that. And we can definitely do that and send the person an email if they want. Um, but I don't want to kind of talk about a topic that I'm not prepared to talk about today. That's fine. Thank you. Um, our next question is, do the new plant-based proteins such as impossible beefs and plant origin meats offer any advantages or trade-offs or reduce inflammation? Yeah, so there are a lot of um, different, you know, kind of alternatives to um, red meat, to, you know, um, meat in general for people who want to maybe have more of a vegan diet. Um, which is, uh, you know, not or vegetarian, not eating meat. And, you know, there's a lot of different, um, different theories on those. Uh, they are also highly processed to a certain degree um, so that they look like meat and that they feel like meat and things like that. So I think there's mixed reviews on how healthy they technically are for you. So the way that I think about it, I'm vegetarian and you know I get excited when something new comes out like that. And I went on this whole binge of eating like a lot of um, impossible burgers. But when it came down to it, I realized that um, that at the end of the day, uh, it is uh, best to eat natural foods. Um, and so that's like, you know, going back to that Mediterranean diet, they tend to just eat a lot of just um, fruits and vegetables and they don't tend to over prepare them. So, you know, um, and uh, nuts and um, yogurt and things like that. So just very easy, simple recipes and foods that don't require a lot of cooking and a lot of um, uh, processing, I guess, is the, the way to say it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, the next question is, could you address the role of a, I'm gonna, excuse my pronunciation on this, but Ayurvedic herbs to fight inflammation, such as ginger or turmeric? Yeah, sure. So, um, so there are a lot of herbs that have been promoted also in um, being anti-inflammatory and turmeric is definitely one of those. And what was the other one that you mentioned? Sorry. Uh, ginger. Ginger. Sure. So all of these are, you know, um, natural kind of um, herb supplements like ginger, um, you know, uh, turmeric, all these things. Uh, do have been shown to maybe have some benefit um, in our diet. Uh, again, you know, if turmeric, if you like the way that it tastes in different recipes, great. If you don't, that's okay. You don't have to add, um, you know, any particular uh, kind of herb or uh, spice to your food, but, but there are certain things about turmeric that have, um, you know, recently caught the attention of 
people and um, people that are practicing different food um, research. And so uh, there might be some benefits. Uh, again, if you want to add it into your diet, it might help. Uh, but there's not going to be kind of like a magical um, recipe to get you healthy. Thank you. Our next question is, can artificial colors such as red number five exaggerate inflammation or asthma? So it goes back to the same principles. You know, if something's not natural, it's likely not going to be as healthy. Um, and again, uh, I think we touched on this, but if anything makes you feel sick, makes you feel like it's um, making your asthma worse, then that's a food that your body is not responding well to and that, you know, you should avoid. And so, um, you know, red food coloring is very artificial. <laughs> and so if you can limit your use or limit foods that contain that, that is always the best practice. Um, again, natural is best. Um, you know, anything that comes off of trees comes out of the ground and you can prepare it in an easy, simple way. That's going to be most easily digested by your body. Thank you. Um, someone would like to know what about dairy? Is dairy inf inflammatory? So, um, you know, dairy, there, there's been a lot of talk about, again, vegan diet, which includes not eating any kind of plant-based or I'm sorry, any kind of, um, you know, animal-based product and dairy is one of those. So for, I think, um, dairy does fall into one of the more, um, inflammatory, like maybe inflammatory foods, but there's also a lot of benefits to dairy. Um, they're high in protein. Um, and so it's not all bad. Um, but again, everything in moderation, that's the key. Um, and so having too much of, you know, too much dairy um, is possibly not good because it is high in fat. Thank you for that. And our last question, it looks like is one of our listeners works with children with asthma, and they would like to know if you have any suggestions for children besides avoiding processed foods and the drive through diet. Um, I think with children, um, it, a lot of times juice. So, um, you know, like a lot of parents will think like orange juice is healthy. Um, but actually any kind of juice tends to be high in sugar. Um, and so that can, um, that kids can fall into a lot of problems with, um, just juice, to be honest with you. And, and it's oftentimes not mentioned during a visit because parents just think it's healthy. So kids could be consuming like gallons of juice a day and um, everyone just thinks it's healthy, but it's not. And so I would really, with all of your pediatric patients, I would check in regarding that. And kids should really just be drinking water as much as possible. And if they develop a taste for water, that's like ideal um, water. You can like, you know, put a little bit of lemon if you want in it um, to kind of make it exciting and interesting if your kid doesn't like water, but um, juices in general, they lose all that fiber from fruit and they really just condense it down into this like sugary water. And so um, with fruits, you want to, um, you want to eat the whole fruit as much as possible. Um, and so that's one thing that I would suggest. Um, and then again, natural, you know, anything that's natural um, uh, is great for kids. So um, vegetables, steamed vegetables, uh, raw vegetables that you can eat raw are great. Um, broccoli, and then, you know, uh, things like that. And so I think just um, having a balanced diet, but, um, and trying not to, and then obviously things like potato chips and things like uh, snack foods can also be very dangerous for kids. So I always just tell parents that um, if it's not good for your child, just try not to buy it. So I know that parents like to have snack foods at home for themselves, but inevitably your child is going to watch you eat it and then want to eat it too. So those are just some suggestions that I always tell parents um, uh, to be mindful of um, and hopefully they help. But, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, if a child is overweight or obese, then I always involve a dietitian um, in the picture because it's really important to reverse whatever habits are being built um, so that you can get that child back on a healthy, um, healthy foot. 
Awesome, thank you. Um, before we wrap up, Courtney and Dr. Gupta, do you have any final thoughts to share? I would just like to reiterate what Dr. G was saying about whole foods. It's like, um, you know, know the food that you're eating, <laughs> preferably see it in its, its normal natural shape before you dive into it. Um, and that just means try and get it as unprocessed as possible. And eating healthy doesn't have to be expensive either. I feel like there's also that other side of the story about, oh, well, you have to eat all these fruits and these vegetables and this whole grains and beans or pulses. And how do I get my protein in if I can't eat meat? Because meat's the cheaper alternative. There are a lot of like great options that are available. You know, canned foods are not great necessarily in all to regards, but they are really you know, there are affordable options just to make sure you read the ingredients because a lot of canned foods have all of these additives like sugar and salt. So just be aware of those little, you know, places where sugar and salt can hide. But again, I think a healthy diet is accessible and I think we can probably ruffle up some links to help you kind of see how to, how to eat healthy if you're on a budget. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gupta and Courtney for your expertise. Um, we hope everyone who joined us learned about how to add healthy eating to your asthma management plan. And now it's time to announce the winner of the Fitbit Lux Fitness Tracker. The winner is Jocelyn Meza. Congratulations, we will be in touch with you by email to make arrangements on how to get that Fitbit Lux to you. Feel free to leave a comment in the Zoom chat or the Facebook post and give us some feedback. Once again, we welcome you to click on the link in the Zoom chat or the Facebook post to learn more about lifestyle changes to manage asthma. We will post some links to resources that can help you manage stress and asthma. Or you can visit our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. There's also a link in the Zoom chat and the Facebook post to Dr. Gupta's and Courtney's podcast, BH Podcast. Make sure to just subscribe to it. Once again, we thank GSK for sponsoring our Living Well with Asthma campaign, and we thank you all for joining us. Everyone have a great night. Thank you.